Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that uh, we can meet here in the morning, that we can open your word together, and that we can receive um, light uh, for the day, light for our feet. We know there's many decisions that we have to make day by day, uh, decisions to obey your voice, to follow you, uh, decisions that uh, sometimes are not as clear as we would like. And so we just ask, Lord, that we can spend time hearing your voice in prayer individually. And we pray for one another. We know, Lord, that there's many trials that uh, and snares that beset, beset our feet. And um, we ask, Lord, that you can give us grace and mercy and help us as we struggle um, on this path. We pray for an understanding of your word, uh, that the things that we are studying um, will be clear to our understanding and that they will affect us and that we can share them with others. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning again. Now, uh, a couple of uh, little things that I want to address. So one is for those who go to a Call to Unity uh, WhatsApp group, there's uh, Helia Mars, he's uh, not really sure who he is, but uh, that's the name he has, Hel Helia Mar. Anyway, he was doing this count, which I thought was rather interesting. And we talked about at the end of the study yesterday that there's um, 18 years and seven months between October 22nd, 1844 and May 21st. Well, you know, so it depends how you count that. Right. So. If you're going to count months, like this would be on our calendar, it's 18 years and seven months. Now, of course, October 22nd is the 22nd. May is either 21st for the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's what you get on Wikipedia. Most Adventist sites seem to have May 21st not, or May 23rd, not May 21st, 1863. But you can obviously we know it, it's going to be from 18... We, we always talk about the 19 years, but it's actually 18 years and seven months if we're going to mark the establishment of the Adventist church. So, of course, that's that's interesting. Now, if you do an inclusive count to May 23rd, it would be 18 years, seven months and two days. Right. If you do an exclusive count to May 30, 31st, it would be 18 years, seven months months right now helia mar is trying to say it's 18 years six months and 27 days an incomplete judgment well if it was 20 and he says it's one day short but if it was 28 days it still wouldn't be 18 years and seven months and i'm, I'm not sure how he gets his count Stephen, do you understand what what he was doing is it the program that he's using that's exclusive in its count or something Stephen? yeah i'm not too sure yeah my seems to be wrong <laughs> i don't know well, well it, it, it must be an exclusive count. The The program he's using goes from October 22, 1844 to May 21st, 1863. It says 18 years, six months and 27 days. And, and I'm not quite sure how it gets that count. Now it has uh, 6,800 or 6,785 days, which just a cardinal count would be 6,786 days. So not really sure why, but, but the idea of this incomplete, it, his idea doesn't really make sense. You know, he says time stopped on May 21st, 1863. And so and then he deals with this Jubilee thing. And, and then he's got to have uh, the seventh angel sounded the trumpet on September 11th, 2001. Obviously, we know that the trumpet was sounded on October 22, 1844. The third woe is in the seventh trumpet, but the third woe is not sounded again, or, or the seventh trumpet's not sounded again when the third woe arrives. And so then he starts counting from September 11th, 2001. Time started counting again. And then he says the 49th birthday arrives April 17th, 2032. Do you know what that means? What what is he trying to say with that? It, I mean, it's a number of days is eleven thousand one hundred and seventeen days, but I, I don't understand why he's choosing that date. No, so 
April 17th, 2032. Did you understand that at all, Stephen? No, I didn't. No. No, no, so, I didn't. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, maybe he just counted those number of days and thought, well, you know, that's, yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't really make any sense to me. I'm not really sure. So he says the year of Jubilee ends April 12th, 2033, right? So he's got all this time setting stuff. So then um, I just made a comment that uh, it would be 18 years, seven months, and two days inclusive, right? And then I asked him about April 27th. He didn't seem to, April, I mean, 17th, 2032, he didn't seem to answer that. Then I made some comments about the Sora cycle, 223 months, which is 18 years and seven months on the Islamic calendar, which which I think is pretty interesting. Now, you weren't here yesterday when we were talking about that. So what, what do you think about that, the Soros count cycle and the 223 months? So you got so 18 years and seven months, obviously, on our calendar is not the Soros cycle, but 18 years and seven months on a lunar calendar, completely lunar calendar, is a Soros cycle. So 223 months, obviously, is, should be some kind of symbol. Any, any thoughts on that, Stephen? Did you look at it at all? Yeah, I, I thought that, yeah, yeah, I was looking at the, the Soros cycle. It's actually um, from the, the uh, Gregorian calendar, 223 months, and the lunar. I think there's like 200 days difference. Yeah, 200 <laughs> days between the two. So 6,787 is... 223 months on our calendar. Now, it depends, of course, where you start, right, in the year. But on, on the, the, um, the lunar calendar, yeah, it's uh, 6,585 days. So you got 6,787 or 6,786. If you just take 30.436875 as the length of a month and you multiply it by 223, you get 6,787. So it's 202 days difference. But anyway, I just thought it was interesting, this 18 years and seven months that occurs with the Soros cycle on the lunar calendar. Okay, so. Yeah, you, you could have the symbol there. 18 years, sorry. 18 years, seven months. Yeah. 18 years, seven months, and then maybe the 202s, like 2020, maybe? Yeah, possibly um, the difference between the two. Now, what about 223 months as a symbol? Well, it reminds me of the 2300 days, but there's an extra two there. You know, so yeah. so I, I'm not too sure. 22nd of March, I don't know. Nothing really stands out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. So then, uh, obviously, with this date for the founding of the Adventist Church, um, we know from the study that Odilio had done if we count from May 23rd, 1863, there's 57,400 days to July 18, 2020, and that's the number of the tribe of Zebulun. So we had tied that together. Uh, Odilio, I think Odilio used May 21st, though, but that didn't actually work out. And I'm not sure why he chose May 20. Well, he looked at Wikipedia, but it, he had to do, I think, I don't know, it, it just a cardinal count from May 23rd, 1863. To July 18th is 57,400 days. So that's, that's all I know. So so it's either the 21st or the 23rd of May, but both symbols work. Now, you had noted that um, in this article from the Review and Herald that the session's proceedings finally concluded with the baptism of eight new believers on the morning of Sunday, May 24th. So we got that symbol. It was, uh, from, Advent Re- it was from Advent Review. Yeah, the Adventist Review or Advent oh. Review. Yeah, so it's not the Review and Herald. I'm not thinking more the old names for it. So this yeah, is the more recent article. Yeah, it's the Adventist Review, but yeah, the the modern version of the magazine. Do you know what year it was from? Did they anyway? So I think it was like an anniversary year. So maybe you know, it was maybe 2013 or something. Maybe or like 150 okay. years or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so one thing we can say is that both dates are valid in that context so anyway that's just a loose end um from the study from yesterday which i which i think is really interesting um now of course uh you know people can think it's all just numerology or something but we we know it's palmoni it's just just showing the design of of adventist history the prophetic periods all of those things and and 
one of the things we can say is that when we deal with the 2520 prophetic mirror and we address now, you know, a question also that was in, in the chat was regarding, I think Jeff asked the question regarding about, well, when is the 2520 or the charts rejected? I don't actually believe that the charts are rejected uh, in any official capacity by the church. The church never discusses them and never votes on them in any way. So the idea that the 2520 was officially rejected at, at the, the General Conference in 1863 or that the charts were rejected because they needed a new chart. The reason they needed a new chart is they had run out of the old charts. That was the only reason why they needed a new chart. So they had printed 300 of the 1843 charts. And of course, yeah, I don't think they deliberately ignored the charts. So that's Angela's making deliberately ignoring the charts. I don't think they were deliberately ignored uh, at that time in 1863. I see no evidence of it in any. I was talking more about, sorry, I was talking more about this time. I mean, I have tried to convince yeah. things to yeah. elders and, Oh, that was in Millwright days. We no longer go by that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. What that? Okay. What do we found it on then? <laughs> yeah. So in 1863, they didn't they didn't officially, you know, reject when, in making a new chart. They just needed a new chart. Now the new chart doesn't have the 2520 on it, but it doesn't have lots of things on it, right? It doesn't have the 1260. There's lots of things that were left off, but in the booklet, so it's a chart. And a book, right? Christian sketches, like Christian sketches. Oh, the book that goes with it is just called the key. The key, okay. It's the key. It's the key to the prophetic chart. So now the thing is, this chart doesn't speak, right? The other charts, they speak. They have words on them, right? They have scripture texts. In the 1863 chart, they took the pictures from the 1850 chart. They reversed them. They flipped them over. And I'm not sure why that might have been some convenience in the way that they did the printing. I don't know. Uh, but they, but they had them flipped over. Um, and some people may yeah, think, I know that. That. right. So there, and there are some differences in some of the, the diagrams and, 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 and I did a series dealing with this, uh, a couple of times actually dealing with the 1843, 1850 and 1863 charts, which are on my, uh, YouTube page. Uh, but with the 2520 is still there. And the thing that's there that's not on the other charts is the week of Christ. So the 70th week is on the 1863 chart, you know, so with with the dates, right, with the two spans of 42 months in there. And, and of course, that symbolizes the prophetic mirror. Right. So one of the things you, well, you see here on your screen, that 4242 uh, with the footnote 49 beside it. But we know that that represents the 2520, the 42 weeks of the, of the 1264, the scattering of the power of the holy people and the 42 months for the treading underfoot, right? So that's the 2520. And so that's represented on the 1863 chart, but it, it's in a sense hidden. And we know if we take uh, 42 plus 42, that's 84, and you multiply it by 31, the center of the 70th week, you get uh, 260, was it 2604, which is the whole length of the prophetic mirror. So on the 1863 chart, God in his providence, as a witness against the rejection of, of prophecy, uh, puts that, that, that warning message in that 70th week, which we could only understand here in our time. No one else in that time would have understood it. So, you know, it's not an out and out rejection by the church. It's not like they did a vote and we reject the 1843 and 1850 charts and we're making a new chart to replace them. It's just simply they ran out of charts. They wanted some charts for evangelism. They instead of putting the text on the chart, they put it in a key or a booklet, which has 677 B.C. for the start of Babylon in it. So they obviously are. What's the name of the? Uh, sorry, uh, what's the name of what's the name of that book that goes with the sixty three chart? Key, K E Y. Oh, key. Okay. Key. So it's the key to the prophetic chart. So if you, uh, I mean, uh, I could put it in an email and yeah, or put it, can, in, can. or put it on the chat or something like that. 
Yeah. I'll just put it on the, the chat. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where it is on my computer. Yeah. So this has been, uh, here, let me see if I can quickly find it because I don't know what I called it. I got, I got all three charts. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't see it here in this. I got it somewhere. I'll, I'll end up putting it up, up on the chat. So okay. Can, thanks. Thanks. I just don't remember what I called, called the file. It might be called prophetic key or something like that. But anyway, so in 1863, we have this date. And so we have the prophetic mirror, and we all accept that. The prophetic mirror, I think Jeff still accepts it, you know, the two, two 2520s. But within that, we have this symbol for July 18th, the 18 years and seven months. So it, the idea of rejecting July 18 when we have, I mean, that's then that's a minor evidence. I mean, we have so many evidences for it. But it's the thing is, we use the same reasoning, the same sort of way of studying the Bible, for instance, to understand the 2520, as to understand July 18, 2020. So if you start rejecting July 18th, as I said before, you know, if you pull on the thread, uh, the loose thread on that sweater, it's all going to unravel. You just end up with a ball of yarn at your feet. And this is really what has happened in the movement, that everything is unraveled because they rejected something. And we know that it's, we can't, we just can't do that. So, um, you know, and we had a little bit of a discussion before, before the study, before we started recording just about, you know, what Jeff was saying on, on Sabbath. And I still maintain that Jeff is taking the role of Miller after October 22nd, 1844. He's being withheld. That is the truth is being withheld from him. He doesn't know what we are studying. He just hears the reports, the false reports, and believes them. But yet people are just choosing to follow Jeff. And that's, you know, it's, I mean, it's prophetic. It's sad. It's unfortunate that people aren't going to take the time to diligently study and decide for themselves. And it doesn't mean that everything that we do is right, that our understanding is, is correct and other people's understanding is wrong. It doesn't make us better than anyone else. It, you know, there's no, there's no room for boasting or anything like that. I mean, we all have struggles that we have to face. We all have a battle. Other people have their battles. And so this is never saying anything about individuals. You know, it's never putting down other people that they're somehow, you know, stupid and we're smart and all those kinds of things that people tend to, to do in these sorts of situations. The reality is, we are just doing what God asked us to do, whether it's approved by the church, whether it's approved by man, whether it's approved by Jeff or not, it doesn't, doesn't matter. We know it's approved by God. Study thyself, study to show thyself approved of God or approved by God, right? Isn't that, I, I, I'm sort of maybe paraphrasing it. Right, leave the Bible Second Timothy 2.50. Yeah, here it is. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And it says, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And, and you can see that sort of parallel to what people are doing when it comes to how they study. They're just listening to, well, foolishness or what, what's the word? Um, profane and vain babblings. And that's, that's sort of what I see throughout Christendom, throughout Adventism. I mean, we, we could say that about all the videos on the eclipse and, and all the different, uh, you know, the sensationalism that occurs and has occurred in this movement. And, and the idea is that, um, we just need to understand the truth. It's not about what's attractive or what's sensational or what's going to get the most number of views on YouTube. You know, because I've thought about it a little bit. Just, you know, I could make more provocative titles for my videos. I could, you know, you see people doing it. It's a lot of it's, you know, clickbait. And, and I see it within all, all kinds of groups um, who profess to be present truth of some sort. But I don't believe that's how God works. I believe that God's spirit needs to speak to the heart of man. God needs to lead 
people to the truth because it is the truth. It, the type of uh, bait you use will determine the type of fish you catch. And, and the church has made a mistake in the type of bait it has used. Sensationalism still seems to be uh, used in, in a lot of cases to try to attract people. And I just believe that the truth is the truth. It's, it's more powerful than anything else. Okay, so that all being said, we're supposed to take a look at this, these verses. So Daniel 11, verse 37 to 39, and try to, uh, and, and we did a review. So I'm just going to do the review of our review, just quickly go through these verses. So we made some changes to the historical application. And some of them, you know, I would call a major change. But it says here, and neither shall he, papal Rome, so we, we understand that the he is papal Rome, regard the gods of his fathers. So we had said instead of the God of his fathers, we're going to say that the father of papal Rome is pagan Rome. You know, and, and we can discuss these things too. Again, you know, because people have time to think about them. And not everybody was here yesterday that's here today. Uh, but the idea here is that this is just pagan gods that are being referred to. Now, of course, we know that the Hebrew word is not always as clear, whether it's God or gods, because it's in the plural already, el Hohim. But here it's, uh, you know, I'm going to, I made the suggestions that this is the gods of the, the, the gods of the fathers, the fathers of papal Rome are pagan Rome. So his fathers are pagan Rome and nor the desire of women. Now, here we're saying that this desire of women is not talking about like the physical attraction to women, which the traditional view of this is, you know, has to do with the celibacy of, of the Catholic priesthood. And, uh, so we're saying that this is more like the desire of ages or the desire of the woman who is going to be looking for this promised seed to be born to her. So that that is what the desire is referring to, such as when Eve had, is it when she had Cain, you know, God has given me a man, right? So she looks at Cain as if he's the promised seed, maybe that was promised. So we're saying that not having the desire of women is the rejection of the promised seed. It's a, it's a rejection of Christ. They, so they don't regard the gods of the fathers, nor the true God, the promised seed, Christ, nor regard any God that is he shall magnify himself. Above all, that is, this is referring to the supreme authority of the cat, the Roman bishop, the pope, as God on earth. And then, uh, so and, any comments on that verse so far, uh, or that verse? So I think it works, whether, whether it's, it's to change our interpretation of the verse that way. I don't know if that's the best thing to do, but that's what we've done. Okay. Whether we're going to change it back, I don't know. Uh, but in his estate shall he honor the God of fortresses. Of course, King James says uh, the God of forces, God being capitalized to obviously be the true God. But in his estate, he shall honor, honor the. So obviously it wouldn't be the true God of forces, but he's going to honor the God of fortresses. Now, we, we could have put gods there, too, because it's obviously in plural, but fortresses. So this has to do with. Supreme civil authority, that is, the Catholic Church uses this supreme religious authority and it honors this civil authority and, and seeks to have that civil authority. It sets up kings and takes down kings and so forth. And then it says, a God whom his fathers knew not. Well, we're going to make that as the capital God. That's going to be the true God. That is, if the fathers are pagan, paganism, pagan Rome, then that means obviously the God that their fathers knew not would be the true God. But in this case, the papacy is going to honor the true God with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. So these honors, in quotation marks, is idolatrous worship, something that is condemned by the second commandment. So obviously he's not truly honoring him. But he is, right? I mean, obviously, we have this God that the pagans never knew, and they're going to use this idolatry to represent the true God. And then this part was, was interesting, and we still have to probably discuss this a bit. Thus shall he do, now we know the King James says, in the most strongholds, but the Hebrew has a lamed at the beginning of the word places of refuge or whatever. 
So, so that means against the, the lamid means a directionally, it's a directional marking. So it's usually translated in like is against or two. Two is probably the most common way uh, to translate it. Now, of course, thus shall he do to the most strongholds. That, that would work as well, but I chose against the most strongholds. And this, the most strongholds is an emphasis. It's a doubling of, of two different words, but that mean the same thing. So it's a, a place of refuge or a, a, a place of defense, right? Those are put together, and that's why the King James puts the most. It's using it as, as an emphasis that is, I can't think of the word again, superlative. So we're saying that this, what they do is they go against the place of refuge, which really is the truth of God's word, uh, where persecuted Christians Christians have fled for refuge. So it's not even so much about the wilderness itself, though it, it re- addresses that. But really, the place that is the strongest refuge for the Christian is God's word. Um, Why did you put uh, God in place of uh, cap- capital G, God in place of the Lord? Right, so, I'm, I'm, so I'm switching them around. So the way that the translators translated this, by putting, so in the beginning, like at the first verse there, the verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his father. So they're saying the God of his fathers here is the true God and that the fathers would be right. So obviously the translators are not understanding these verses in the way that we are because they wouldn't be looking at this as papal Rome. Okay. In the first place. So when we understand this as papal Rome and then we understand who the father is, well, the father is pagan Rome. So that that's why we changed it from a capital G to a lowercase G and pluralize it. And then later when it says um, in his state, he shall honor the God of fortresses. Well, obviously, that's not the true God. God is not the God of fortresses. That is, this is referring to military might. So this is worshiping or honoring the civil authority, the the power of the state. And so that's how we understand that. So we change it from capital to the lowercase again. But in the next part, it's they they have um, as a God. Right. A God. Any God. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, and so, yeah, so, but this is the God of fortresses. I mean, it does have the definite article. So the God of fortresses or forces, I mean, this would be Satan in, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. But here in this context, we're just saying that, that this is the Catholic Church depending upon and being involved in the civil authority of the state. So the idea of a fortress as as, as a military power. So this is military or civil. And then when it says, and a God whom the fathers knew not, well, they they put it as just a lowercase God, but we're saying it, and God whom his fathers knew not. We're saying that this is a reference to the true God, that he's going to honor with this idolatrous worship. Okay. All this. I I can can kind of see that now. Okay. It works in there. Yeah. So, so that the true God is now, so he's worshiping these false gods and his father's a false God, right? It's the pagan gods, but he's going to take the true God and then do all this idolatry. And then it says, thus shall he do uh, against the most strongholds. Now here, so we're going to take these strongholds, these places of refuge, uh, addressing uh, God's word. And he's going to do this. He's going to come against God's word with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. So that means that there is this strange God that's mixed in, and and that's why I use that word syncretistic. That's just a mixture of pagan and Christian God into what we now call the Catholic Church, right? The, The worship of most of Christianity, actually. So the Christian God is a syncretistic God. It's, it's not, it's not the God of the Bible. And it's not purely a pagan God. It's a mixture. And he's going to acknowledge. And that word acknowledge means to gaze intently upon and then increase with glory. So just giving more and more honor to these false gods. And then he, the papal power, shall cause them, that is these false gods, that's the saints and the priesthood, right, to rule over many. 
that's Christendom. Remember, this is during the 1260 years and shall divide the land for gain. So we're just saying that this has to do with the ecclesiastical, con- ecclesiastical conquest through assumed papal authority. So the Catholic Church has done that. That's just a historical fact during the 1260s. So this is describing the characteristic of the papacy during the 1260 years. Now, Angela made another comment, just um, uh, reminds me of Paul and his companion being lauded by the pagans of a certain town until they revealed the true God and what they were and that they were only mortals. So we see all these these false gods, you know, and I've probably told this story before. You know, I wasn't raised Catholic at all, so I, I never, ever prayed to any saint. Uh, but I remember, you know, I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood, got w- woken up one morning out in the back alley. There was a, a guy uh, that the police were uh, trying to deal with, and he was obviously on some kind of drug trip, I would assume. Uh, but he was praying to all these different saints. You know, you know, I just thought it was so strange. Like he's yelling at the top of his voice, you know, to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and St. Peter and, and, you know, to help him, to save him from these policemen. So it's kind of humorous in a way. Uh, but the fact is there are many, many Catholics who, who pray to saints that can't hear them. And, uh, and I'm sure he included Mary in there somewhere as well. So there are people who pray to Mary all the time. And we would take it that Mary is not in heaven right now. Uh, she definitely wouldn't have come up in the resurrection of those that were crucified. Or when, when Jesus was crucified, those that came up in the resurrection up there from all these different generations. So obviously they're praying to demons, right, to false gods. So if we're going to look at this, these verses and put in, in the present truth application, this is where we, we run into some difficulty. I mean, we could just say, you know, papal Rome in the past, in the 1260 uh, years, is going to represent papal Rome in our time. But, but I think we really have to say that this is modern Rome. Now, when we say modern Rome, what do we mean? What is modern Rome? Papal Rome. But is it just papal Rome? Or does modern Rome include more than just the papacy? Agreed. It's the, it's the, it's the Protestant churches. Uh, following the Pope of Rome. Okay. No, no, no. So the, the U.S. as well, right now, the way it's yeah. following Francis and Biden. And, and we also think about, you know, what is Rome? I mean, what what is it that has been inherited from Rome in our modern society? I mean, in, in a lot of ways, our, our world is a Roman world, right? We know the final kingdom is Rome. It goes from pagan to papal then to modern Rome. There's there's three phases of Rome, really. Yeah, so it's well it's the return of the previous Romes. Well to some degree. So we can we can say that Rome definitely includes a lot more than just the papal power. And if we look at, at the United States, the United States has modeled itself after Rome. It's it's a republic, right? It's modeling itself after the Roman Republic. They have in the United States, they have a Senate. Well, that's something that comes from Rome. If we look at, at the buildings that were built. Do we see any similarity between a lot of the, the official state buildings in the United States and those of the buildings of Rome? Do we see any similarity? Uh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So, also amongst all, amongst all their holidays, too. Yeah. Well, yeah, some of them are, you know, mixtures. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. But yeah, so we see, we see that that we live in the time of Rome. And the embodiment of that is, I think, to some degree, even though we look at the United States, it's it's the promised land as well, right? From It's it's the, the pleasant land. But, but it's also because it has horns like a lamb, but it speaks as a dragon. And, and we can even look at, to some degree, as the UN, even though we can look at the symbols of Babylon as well. So we know that there's, there's literal Babylon and there's spiritual Babylon. You know, there's pagan, pagan Rome and there's papal Rome. Papal Rome, in a sense, is spiritual Rome. But, but we still have those things today. Babylon still exists. Its influence exists. But it's through Rome that Babylon's influence exists, right? Because Rome inherits with that 666 symbol in the three different periods of 666 that we have, right? The one from the captivity of Jehoiachin, 
to 70 AD, that's 666 years. That's uh, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 that ties those two sister chapters together with those two sieges. And then, and then we have the 666 years that Miller had um, from 158 to 508 and the 666 years uh, from 129 BC to 538. These three periods of 666 years symbolizing these things that are inherited from Babylon to Rome and, and to, to, to first the pa- pagan Rome, but also to papal Rome. So that number 666 has to do with the authority of the power of Rome. Now, Rome is by nature a syncretistic power, right? That's that's what it does, is it it adopts and adapts the religions and the political structures of the nations that it conquers. It it, it takes what we may be called the best characteristics of these powers and utilizes them. You know, it, it incorporates these structures. It doesn't just conquer and destroy like some nations did in the past, like the Assyrians, right? And even the Babylonians, it takes characteristics of that. It takes, you know, that sort of the pride of the power of of Babylon. It takes from uh, Media Persia, it takes this sort of organizational structure, the law of the Medes and the Persians. From Greece, it takes its philosophy and education, and it combines these all together to become, you know, Rome. Also, papal Rome does the same thing, but more on on the religious scale than pagan Rome. Uh, But we see today that uh, the world is a mishmash of all kinds of different beliefs and and cultures and so forth. And that's a characteristic of Rome. And and the truth ends up getting buried. So, So the point here is, if we're going to talk about papal Rome, we could talk about modern Rome, but that's very broad. Now, we're saying that if modern Rome does not regard the gods of his fathers, we would look at this as secularism. So the fathers is this religious world, but in we can see how modern Rome has become more secular. That is, you understand what I'm saying there, right? So obviously the fathers are all of these, these other Romes that have gone before. But it, it is adopted and adapted uh, with the society of today, modern society. So in, in this case, uh, the fathers are pagan and papal Rome, or we could even just say, so I'll put pagan and papal Rome are the fathers in this case. So pagan Rome equals in this case, I could have just put papal Rome, but I'm going to put that. So so they, they've rejected religious that, that there is any sort of religious power, right? It, we live in a secular society. So we're just putting that there. That's just a you know placeholder for now. We, we might figure it's something else. Uh, nor the desire of women. Now, we're saying that this is a rejection of the promised seed. Now, the promised seed is, you know, we'll just say basically, simply, the best way to look at this is the gospel itself. And, and that would even be true if we, we looked at it in, in the historical application. But maybe in this case, we would just say the everlasting gospel or that is the three angels messages. I'm not going to capitalize it. Now, not that, you know, the, the world even knows what those are, but it has rejected that. It's rejected the everlasting gospel, the three angels messages, that message that came to the United States. So in this modern Rome, uh, we are going to include the U.S., so we'll just put here includes USA. So the USA had this message given to it in Millerite history. And it's it's the message that it has rejected. That is, modern Rome includes the image of the beast, right? The United States. It's it's gonna have it's gonna be this other beast with two horns, like a lamb, church and state, right? Or republicanism and Protestantism. So in that sense, but it's it's going to reject that message. The United States rejects that message. Right. So we know that, you know, even with Francis, he's going to reject a lot of Catholic things. But this is more not so much about the Catholic Church when we deal with modern Rome. It includes the papacy. 
because there is a threefold union. And we know Babylon is a city with three parts, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. In some ways, modern Rome has all of those as well. In some ways, the UN has modeled itself after Rome, though it leans more towards a model after Babylon. But they're still all connected. So, so the United States, and, and, and so, uh, so pagan Rome, pagan and papal Rome, you know, I, I'm not totally happy with that. I mean, basically we could say, uh, true religion or, uh, or religion in general, superstition. I don't know. Anyway, it, it's just pointing to the idea that we have a secular society, but it has rejected the everlasting gospel. That message was given throughout the world, but particularly in the United States. And that message has been rejected. So nor, uh, nor regard any God. Now we can't, we didn't put anything here. What's it? So maybe ask, uh, Danny asked the question. What's the difference between modern Babylon and modern Rome? Well, not lots, but the symbol is different. So there's things about Babylon that are used when you talk about Babylon that you would be using the symbols from Babylon to illustrate things. And if you're talking about Rome, you're going to be using the symbols that come from Rome to illustrate things. But really, they're the same power in, in the end, right? We, we could, you know, argue that Babylon, mystery, Babylon, gate, great, the mother of harlots, you know, she's the Catholic Church. But we know the Babylon, the city of Babylon divides into three parts, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And obviously, the false prophet's the United States. The dragon power is the UN. Only the beast is the Catholic Church. So we just we just have a different illustration. In some ways, and some people make this argument about John writing the book of Revelation, that he uses the symbol of Babylon uh, because he's writing things against Rome uh, using this Old Testament symbolism. So it's not clear that he's actually speaking about, at that time, pagan Rome in many, many cases. But... You know, and I think that's that's probably partly true because, you know, he's writing that in exile, the book of Revelation. So it's so obviously if you're talking about Babylon, the Romans aren't going to care. He doesn't mention Rome by name, but he alludes to it through the symbols of the past, through biblical symbols. Right. So we can see that Rome is being referenced. I mean, obviously, the great red dragon is dealing with pagan Rome and, and it coming against this you know, this woman who's going to give birth to this man child and, and, and all of that. So we know that that's talking about pagan Rome, but it's not, he doesn't say Rome, right? So, so that's one of the, the views that people have on that, which is probably uh, correct. Now, then we have nor regard any God that we can say, well, well, this is a type of atheism. This is why Uriah Smith and Alexander Keith, you know, they say, well, this must be France because France is atheistic. But but we can definitely say that this is a reference to, and I think what I'm going to do here. So I think I see what what's happening. So I'm going to put this in here. Uh, how am I going to do this? I'm just going to put it in red. I'll just say the UN here. I didn't put uh, a historic application here, but I'm going to put the UN in there. And so what is it we see here? We see we have this thing modern Rome, and there are three things. Right. So we see this three step. He rejects the God of his fathers. So that's referring to pagan and papal Rome. Those are are rejected by modern Rome. Right. In, in this, their historic, uh, all of the, the things of those religions, they, they become rejected, though there's a certain parts of them that that exist. Nor the desire of woman. So this would be referring to the preaching of the everlasting gospel, the three angels messages in American history. So this would refer to so the first one, pagan and papal Rome. This is going to refer to the part of modern Rome that is the papacy. The rejection of the promised seed, that's going to refer to the false prophet, the United States. And then nor regard any God. This is going to be a reference to the atheism of, of humanism of the UN, the WEF, etc. Okay. So can we see here that it's showing the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in these symbols in our time under this he, right, which we call modern Rome? So I could say modern Rome includes the USA, the UN, and the papacy, or maybe even better, the Vatican. Just how does that look? Does that make sense to people? Yes, it does. 
Okay. Because we got those three, and it and it seems to fit when we look at the characteristics. Now, for he shall magnify himself above all. So we know that it's through the man of sin. Now, what I'm going to put here, you know, so when we say he shall magnify himself above all, we didn't we didn't put who he was, you know, you know, it's obviously papal Rome. And, and we did make sort of reference to it in verse uh, 36. But here it's it's really clear that this is the man of sin. So I'm just going to put the man of sin in this as the historical application. So just to make that clear. And so, no, we, we know here that we, you know, we could say the man of sin, the Antichrist. But this, the, so the man of sin in our time, I mean, we could say the Antichrist. How would we characterize the man of sin? If we just say he's the man of sin in our history? Because we know in Second Thessalonians, it's referring to the man of sin in that history of the 1260. Because in order for the man of sin to be, re- be revealed, the son of perdition, paganism has to be taken out of the way. So historically, this is the man of sin. But how would we characterize, what words would we use to describe the man of sin in our time when he magnifies himself above all? Uh, would we put Satan's personation of Christ? Is Like, is this Satan, or are we just talking about the Pope as a man in our time? Oh, that's a really tough one, because Tra- Francis, to me, is Satan in, incarnate, but I can see him taking, like, he will proclaim himself as God and take away all of this wokeism. Now you don't have to worship these false gods anymore because I am the God. Yeah, so I, I don't think Francis is Satan incarnate. I mean, well, uh, he's definitely inspired by us. Yes. Yeah, I know what you mean. But we do have, we do have when Satan personates Christ, mm-hmm. and, and and ultimately, it's not so much that Satan wants a man, the Pope, to be worshipped as God. Satan himself is using these systems so that he can be placed as God, right? Sitting in the temple of God, oh, showing man. he is God, right? So I would say that the man of sin must be Satan in in the historical application, or in the, in the present truth application. That it can't just be merely a reference to the Pope. It, it has to be Satan. He's the man of sin. In, in our well, time. the foremost man of sin. He just has little manlets of sin right around now. So when he magnifies himself above all, you know, all that is called God, or, or this worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, this is where uh, I believe that Satan personates Christ. Right? That's that's the way that I would understand it. I put Stan there. I you know how many times I've sent a Facebook message and I've blamed Stan for stuff that's actually Satan? Poor Stan. Anyway, I, I, do that. I always miss that first day. Anyway, that's just so. So Satan personates Christ. And that's so if we look at the religious authority that was exercised during the 1260 years, this is what Satan wants to do. That's what he seeks to have. He wants to have that authority of Christ. He wants to be the religious leader. He wants to be the God that is worshipped. So then we have, uh, in his estate, shall he honor the God of fortresses. Now, we know that in the 1260, we look at this as supreme civil authority. So I, I still think that this is a reference to this period of time where Satan is set up. Now, his place in his state, yeah, well, yeah, Rome is the last kingdom of Bible prophecy. Modern Rome is Rome. So that's just a, a comment there. Um, but Daniel, is it? Yeah. So he says, I think modern Rome is the last kingdom in Bible prophecy before Christ comes. In the book of Daniel, chapter 8, each coming kingdom becomes greater than the previous. And I think the coming of the papacy in modern Rome will be greater in that sense. Well, and, and what we know is that modern Rome includes all of these powers. Now, obviously, the Pope is there. We, we know the papacy has this role. And, and one of the things, uh, me and Daniel Fontenot have, have always had this different emphasis. Now, Daniel Fontenot really likes to focus upon uh, the Catholic Church and the Pope. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? We know that 
The papacy is the power behind what's going to happen. But it's the United States that makes the image to the beast. People are generally going to recognize, at least initially, that the Catholic Church has anything to do with this. It's not like the, the Pope is going to be in charge, in he- the head of everything, when this Sunday law comes. We know it becomes comes from the United States. The United States has made an image to the beast, and it's going to cause all those, everybody on earth, to you know, worship the beast and his image, right? So it's the beast and his image. Those two things are going to be worshipped. So many people will be Catholics, but not everybody's going to become Catholic. It's, it's not, it's not what happens. It's that everyone, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, all become controlled, uh, by this, this power. And, which is a satanic power. And in the end, they're really worshiping Satan, right? That, that's the one who wants to be put on the throne of the earth. You know, the Pope himself, I mean, his aspirations are not to, are not the same as Satan's aspirations. Like, I don't know if there's any pope who really wants to be worshipped as God, you know, in that sense. I mean, there might have been some who are pretty narcissistic. But their their role is to put Satan as the one who's going to be worshipped, as Christ. That That's the purpose of the Catholic Church, whether the Catholics know it or not. Uh, because they're acting out the character of Satan. So so when oh, Satan magnifies himself... Uh, yeah, sorry. Catholicism in its own writings says that the Pope is God on earth. And well, be, and they're extremely authoritarian. I was raised in that. And it was yes, I'm, not, there are lots of I'm, not, I'm not denying that. But I'm just saying as a person, they they're they're not that's not what their ultimate goal is, is to have a person worshipped as God. You know. Whether they think that is or not, that's, I'm saying the ultimate purpose of these religions and everything that's happening is for Satan to be worshipped as God. That's what Satan wants, right? Exactly. So, I totally so agree with that. People, so the people themselves, I mean, we, we don't know what their personal feelings are. They, they believe that they have this authority as God on earth because of their, their, their position. Uh, but I don't think any of them really think that they are God, right? In, in the sense, ultimately, they know there's this other God. But Satan himself wants to be worshipped as God. He wants to be God. He thinks he can overthrow God. And they have that characteristic within their religion itself, whether they're aware of it or not. But in his estate shall he honor the God of fortresses. Now, when we dealt with this estate, we dealt with it. It's the word place. And, and to me, this is what's talked about. The, the place that Satan wants is the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, right? He wants to be uh, worshipped. So, so when we looked at this verse, but in his estate shall he honor the God of fortresses. Now, we never really addressed whose estate. We just says his place. And is the his referring to modern Rome or to papal Rome in, in the case of the historic. So let's look at the historic. Is the his estate referring to the place of, of Rome or is it referring to Christ's estate? So in the place of Christ, he's going to honor the God of fortresses. Is, is that what it's saying? Or is it just saying in his place, he's in where he is? So his place could either be the Vatican in a historical application, or it could be the place of Christ. And, and you can see how there's some parallels here to uh, the issue dealing with Daniel chapter eight, right? So if we go to Daniel chapter eight here and, and sort of the, the way that we've tried to understand the place of his sanctuary. So, uh, so out of one of them, out of one of the four winds came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And he magnified himself even to or against the prince of the host. So this is pagan Rome, right? And by him or really from him, the daily was taken away 
and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So here, the place of his sanctuary, this is the Pantheon, this is Rome. And a host was given against the daily by reason of transgression. So that host, it's not given him, it's a host was given against the daily. So that host is the abomination of desolation or the transgression of desolation by reason of transgression. It cast down the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. So it is an it. It is in the feminine form, right? Because that's the feminine form is it and prospered. And then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the point is this place of his sanctuary. That's the, in this case, the place of his sanctuary is Rome. Is, is that clear? This, this is not God's sanctuary. It's not his sanctuary is not God's sanctuary. It's not God's sanctuary that's cast down. Right. As as the modern Adventists say, well, this is Christ's sanctuary that was cast down to the earth. Right. Which which, of course, destroys the twenty three hundred days. If you try to do that and read this in contrast uh, or context, because the sanctuary then that was cast down would be need to be the one that's cleansed. And it's going to be cleansed after two thousand three hundred days. Doesn't doesn't really make sense if we put it in the context of the twenty five twenty and the twenty three hundred days is part of that. It all makes sense. That's why, you know, Miller was able to come to understand the 2300 days ending in 1844. If he had taken it from uh, that the daily was Christ's ministry and when it's cast down, well, we would have quite a while to wait for the end of the 2300 days. So anyway, we have here uh, the place of his sanctuary. So when we go here and, and it talks about his estate or his place. Now, this is a completely different word, but. Are we going to, you know, let's go back here. So how are we going to um, understand this place? Any any dis- discussion on it? And, and, and just about the word place, that's Macomb in 4349. Uh, just um, so people know. And it comes from Kuhn 3559. Yeah, so they're, they're not related words that I can see. So estate is... Cain. Well, they're, they're sort of related. Um, they have some common roots to it. So they are related words, just, uh, you know, from their root. To go back. This is so in his place is a good translation. And, and it is related to Macomb just uh, because of the root. So are we going to say that in his place that is in the Vatican, he shall honor the God of fortresses? Um, histo- historical application. So if we, if we take that as the historical, I mean, we wouldn't have his estate then being Christ's place. But we could say here, if, if we could have made the historical that in his estate, that is in the place of Christ, right, where Christ should be, he's going to be honoring the God of fortresses. So Christ, of course, is not using the God of fortresses. He's not the God of fortresses. That would be Satan. So it'd be putting Satan in the place of Christ. That's one way to look at it. Any, any thoughts on that? Because this one's a little tricky. Because remember, his in Hebrew, it's hard to know which, which it's referring to. It could be referring to back to verse 37. And he shall he, neither shall he, right? But it also could be, you know, referring to, uh, where is it here? Where's the other God, right? Yeah, so we'd have to go back a bit further. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desired woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And in his estate, he shall honor the God of fortresses. So um, so his estate could be re- referring to the true God's estate, or it could be referring to the state or the place of the of, of Rome itself. So which 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 is it? How are we going to decide? Okay, so Daniel says his estate modern Rome makes more sense according to what I think when ascribed to the Vatican. Yeah, so I, I, I think that makes the most sense, but but I don't want to just leave it there. So um, well, I look 
<clears throat> I looked up a place and it's 4349 and it does say a fixture. It's a definite earthly thing. It's, it's, I thought, could it be replacing Christ in our minds, you know, but uh, that's what the t- church teaches, right? More yeah, or less. Okay. Yeah, and then, no, I, I wanted to see, is it a fixture, or is it something that you can, something tangible, or is it something that you think, is it a mindset, and it's definitely a fixture, therefore it must be Rome, you know, the seat of the papacy. Right, and and when we look at the, the law of first mention, this word, uh, Ken, in Genesis 40, verse 13, uh, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee to thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand. So it refers to like his office. In Genesis 41, 13, it came to pass as he, as he interpreted to us. So it was, so it was me he restored unto mine office and him he hanged, right? So it's just going to translate it as office in chapter 41 and as place in uh, chapter 40 of Genesis, right? It's also translated uh, we, we saw it in Daniel 11, three places. Daniel 7, 11, uh, out of the branch of his root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army. So there, you know, it's, it's, it's a place that's being standing up in his estate or so some place is being, someone's being replaced with someone else. Daniel 11, verse 20 and 21, then shall stand up in his estate, a raiser of taxes in the glory of his kingdom. So again, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person, right? So these are dealing with presidents of the United States in our understanding of the or emperors of Rome. Now it's also translated as foot. So in Exodus 30, 18, it just uh, talks about um, the foot also of brass, that is the place or the estate, the place where the where they're making these altars of burnt offering, and et cetera. So they're going to use that word estate. It's also in Leviticus 8, 11, he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all the vessels, both the laver and his foot to sanctify them. So the foot is just the base or the place or the estate, right? So they just don't translate it as estate there, right? They translate it as foot. Okay, makes sense? And it's interesting there, we have the seven times there as well. In that case. So, I mean, I would lean towards the idea that the estate is in his estate. He shall honor the God of fortresses or forces. But that estate is is historically the Vatican. I mean, that's that to me would make the most sense. But I'm saying that it's not impossible that it's it's talking about him replacing him. But in his estate. Now, the other thing is. Uh, we have before that, so it says, but in. Well, the word there is um, 5921. So uh, we've we've had this word lots of times in Daniel chapter 11. Five, so this is the one where, when they says, let me see, where is this? I don't see it. 5921. It says it's in Daniel 11, four, verse 14. And yet I don't see the word. Oh, against, stand up against the king of the south. So that word's going to be st- translated as against. So this, this is the word al. It's, it's a really common uh, preposition. And it's going to be, and there shall stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. So in, in that verse, it's going, so, so you could say, but, Against his estate shall he honor the God of forced fortresses, right? So, so the idea there, the 5921, it, it's not really best translated as in. So it's translated the most commonly as against 541 times, as over 414 times, as on. A Genesis 6 1 is an example. And it came to pass when man began to plot multiply on the face of the earth. Now, as far as in, it's translated as therefore, because, concerning, at, off, above, before, into, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, right? So you could say against, but they use the word into. 
thereon according where to toward beside next and and you go down the list and i can't even find in it must be happen yeah, more maybe i missed it but it's translated so many different ways within eight times into 50 times 69 off 70 at 81 times concerning 84 times because in my king james concordance I, I don't actually see, they don't show the one. So I would assume it's not translated very many times as in. Okay, so that that's just one of the things about this word in. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. We're going to try to address this point, but in his estate, what this, this is actually referring to. Okay, and Angela says, oh, the God of fortresses. So maybe um, there's a problem, she says. Because all other verses acknowledge the true God as the God of fortress, uh, as the fortress. Right. So, so we're going to have to take a look at that uh, tomorrow. So we're going to address the God of fortresses. Is that the true God? I, I know I've looked into it before. So uh, I, I don't think that this is the true God, but, but we, we will look at that. So we'll deal with that and dealing with uh, in his estate. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Nothing I forgot. Okay, let's pray. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for each person who has participated and um, who is watching these studies and seeking to learn the truth. Help us, Lord, to submit our lives to you, to obey your voice in, in everything that you ask of us and to trust in you and in your word. Be with us throughout this day. May your angels watch over us and help us in the decisions we need to make. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.